Hello, you there are looking at me, Matt Parker, talking to you about these numbers that I'm now pointing at. This is a reasonably famous series of numbers in mathematics. And if you've not seen them before, do pause the video and have a go to see if you can work out which one comes next. Uh, I was given this on, must have been my first week of teaching, and I spent all day, but I cracked it. So do pause, try it for yourself. People complain, I don't leave enough pausing time for these puzzles. So I'm gonna use this very brief window to say the video is brought to you by Jane Street. Their internships are open. So if you're at the point in your academic career where an internship in maths and finance would be a good next step, details at the end of the video or in the description. So uh, hello to everyone who paused, welcome back. I assume it's months later. If you spent all that time and you didn't crack it, <laughs> you were gonna hate this. This is the look and say sequence. People will often try to work out like the ratio between the numbers and all these things. No, you look at one number and you say it and that gives you the next number. So the first number is one or more specifically, looking at the digits, one, one. So the next number is one, one. But now we've got two ones. So the next one is two ones. But now there's one, two and one, one. And you keep going each time you look at one and you say it. It's the look and say sequence. And while it feels like it's just a ridiculous cheeky trick question. There's actually some surprisingly deep mathematics behind this and it includes one of the rare examples where the nice, seemingly elegant, perfect solution to a math problem was actually a decoy. There is some serious mathematics behind this sequence of numbers, no other than John Conway got obsessed with it in the 1980s. And what is mathematics? If not finding something ridiculous and then taking it too seriously, which is also the motto of this channel. So the two questions we want to ask about this sequence is, first of all, each sequential term, how much longer than the previous term is it? I guess in the limit as it goes on and on and on. And secondly, what's the ratio between the different digits? Like, are there more ones? Are there more sevens? What's the ratio between them in the long run? However, we are not gonna have a look at the traditional look and say sequence because uh, too many digits, to put it shortly. We're gonna swap it out for the binary look and say sequence. The binary version is exactly the same, but in binary. So it starts one and then one, one, but now when you wanna write two ones, the two is in binary. So it's one, zero, that's two, one. And the next line's pretty straightforward, one, 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 zero, one, one, but now you've got three ones, and three in binary is one, one. And you carry on using exactly the same look and say principle as before. And so we can still ask the question, how long is each next term compared to the previous one as a ratio. And in terms of digits, we've only got one ratio. What is the ratio between zeros to ones? And we can start by just looking at that experimentally. As we go through each one, you can count up the number of ones, count the number of zeros. So the first one that's got a ratio is one, zero, one, two to one, twice as many ones as zeros. The next one, five to one, crazy. And then after a while, it starts to settle down to a pattern. And once you're past the 23rd, term, the pattern looks pretty much like it's just 1.666. So the ratio appears to be one and two thirds. Or is it? For a while there, everyone was happy to just roll with the conjecture that of course it's one and two thirds. It's a nice neat ratio. That's how maths works. But then in 2010, Nathaniel Johnson, who's an associate maths professor at Mount Allison University in Canada, thought, no, I want to double check. I want to prove exactly what that ratio is. And so they used some techniques that John Conway had come up with and applied them to the binary look and see sequence. To make the look and say sequence more manageable, we want to split it apart into a nice finite set of blocks that can be recombined to make any of the infinitely many terms in this series. However, we can't just use like one and zero as our blocks because we're interested in how the blocks lead to each other. So to explain here, here are the 10 blocks, right? 10 blocks. And each one always goes to a set, either one or two other blocks, one after the other. So if you've got a one by itself and ignore the fact, yes, one appears in the other ones. There's not like a unique way to split it apart. You just can split any term apart into these chunks. The one always goes to one one, if you take it as an individual bit, which means that chunk one always goes to chunk two. So 
that's fine. Now chunk two, one, one goes to chunk three and chunk one in that order. And so you can go through for every single one and write for each block, which other blocks or chunks it goes to. And you could represent this as a network, like showing which, which block goes to which. But what we want to know is in the limit, once we've done this over and over and over again, what kind of nice stable ratio do we settle into? And we're not going to do that using a network. We're going to do that using a matrix. And here's the matrix. So each column shows you where a certain block goes to. So the first column only has a single one in position number two. That's because the first block goes directly to the second block, whereas the second column has ones in position one and three, because the second block goes to blocks one and three. So what you can actually do is take any term in this sequence, which is like a series of which blocks you've got, and then you multiply that vector of which blocks you've got in your current term by this matrix, and the result of that matrix multiplication gives you the breakdown of the next term. And so the behavior going from one term to the next is governed by this matrix. But how do we understand the long-term behavior of a matrix if we're multiplying by it over and over? Wow, we need eigenvectors and eigenvalues, one of the most fantastic bits of mathematics that most people have never heard of. But it's okay. If you're one of those people, it's your lucky day. We're going to have a quick crash course in how eigenvectors and eigenvalues work in a segment I like to call Eigen See Clearly Now. I can see clearly now the rain is an equivalent scale. Here I have a nice simple 2 by 2 matrix, 0, 1, 2, 3. Doesn't get much nicer than that. I'm actually going to turn this into negative 2 and negative three. I'm going to multiply it by a one by two matrix, which is going to be one, two, nice and simple and straightforward. And when you multiply these matrices together, you basically you get this one and you flip it over and you, you do a, you know, you multiply zero by one, which is zero, you multiply one by two, which is two, and then you add them together. So uh, that's going to equal the one at the top here is going to be uh, two. And then the one at the bottom here is going to be 1 times negative 2, 2 times negative 3, it's going to be negative uh, 8. So that goes down there. Okay, and that's, that's matrix multiplication. And if you think of these as vectors, this matrix has taken this vector and turned it into that vector, which has a new length and indeed a new direction. But what if I made the one slight change to that being negative 1? at the top. Well, okay, well, let's redo the multiplication. This time it equals, well, that's just still, well, this top one is still two, that hasn't changed, there's our vector, and the bottom one now is now, uh, well, that's going to be positive two times this, so it's going to be negative four this time. Okay, no major change. But then if you have a good look at this, you're like, wait a minute, this vector is that vector just multiplied by negative 2. So actually, I could turn this back into the original vector, negative 1, 2, but put a negative 2 out the front. And so for this specific matrix or vector, if you multiply it by this matrix, you get the same vector just scaled. And that, in a nutshell, is eigenvectors and eigenvalues. This is an eigenvector of this matrix, because if you multiply it by the matrix, you get the same vector, but with a value at the front, the eigenvalue. Not even the only option. So instead of using negative one, two as our vector there, we could put in the vector negative one, one. And it turns out if you multiply that by this matrix, you end up with exactly the same vector, negative one, one, but the eigenvalue is negative one. So each time you multiply it by this matrix, all it's doing is flipping the sign of that vector. Crazy stuff. And this is useful because the process of constantly multiplying by the same matrix and getting out the same thing but scaled means that the ratios of the values within these vectors aren't changing. And that's exactly what we want. We want in the limit when the ratios between the different chunks cease to change. So what we have to do is find the eigenvector and eigenvalues for the big matrix we had, and then that tells us once you hit this steady state, and we're going to look for the biggest 
um, eigenvalue version of the many eigenvectors, that's the ultimate steady state that our series will settle into. And Nathaniel knew about this because their actual research is looking at uh, quantum information theory. I mean, looking at different quantum states. And you use this same idea of eigenvectors and eigenvalues when you're doing quantum physics calculations. And Nathaniel went, ah, I'm going to use them for this, which is much more important. I specifically put these negative values down here because if you just do 0, 1, 2, 3, you can get eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but they're way more complicated. They're not nice, neat integers. You get like square roots of 17 everywhere. I hope now you can uh, matrices how eigenvalues and eigenvectors work. Although to be honest, 3 blue, 1 brown will have a much better video with a much better, nice visual explanation of this. So go check that out. Um, the only downside is uh, their theme song. It's not as good. We just need the eigenvector and eigenvalue for our binary look and say matrix. But how do we find those? Well, in Nathaniel's blog post, which I'll link to below, they explain how they did it. They say using Maple, it is simple to derive this value. They just put it in the software package Maple and it just spat the answer out. And the eigenvalue is 1.465571 and probably more digits and that's it. So in the limit, it settles down to a nice rhythm where each term is 46.65571% longer than the previous one. And the eigenvector looks like this. Interpreting this eigenvector shows us that the first two chunks are irrelevant. In the long run, the chunk with just a one or two ones don't even have to worry about them. And then we have the ratio between the other ones. And so that b squared means that the third and fourth chunks are b squared times as likely to appear or as frequent as the chunks with a one next to them. And we've got more complicated terms involving b. b is just an expression involving a, and a is an expression involving the square root of 93. The eigenvector is all about the square root of 93 when it comes to this matrix. And this is just a nice, neat way to collapse all those terms down so that the eigenvector is a bit easier to look at and understand. But in theory, you should substitute all those things in to get the original ridiculous vector. Now, to get the limiting ratio between ones and zeros, we take the limit ratios we have between all the different chunks and we multiply each of those likelihoods of that chunk being there by the ratio of ones and zeros in that chunk and then we add them all up, and we do not get five divided by three. We get this. So on one hand, mathematicians had one and two thirds. On the other hand, they had this ridiculous expression. And they're like, oh, which one? Which one's it gonna be? In fact, what you're looking at now, allow me to say, is the thumbnail. Good thumbnail. Thanks for watching the video. And it turns out, this ridiculous one is the correct answer, which, to be honest, if you do work it through, comes out to 1.66572 and some stuff. Very close. And the good reminder, that just because it looks like something is the answer in mathematics, you don't know for certain until you do the maths. Thank you for looking at me. Say to you, thank you for looking at this video. It's been fun. And thanks to Nathaniel Johnson for doing the maths in the first place. And thank you to Jane Street who support my channel. They solve very complex mathematical problems in the financial world, which means they just want more mathematicians that they can potentially hire, which is why they support my channel and why they run a very generous internship program. This is in all three of their offices. The London, New York and Hong Kong offices do this. And I have visited all of them. Oh, I'm doing Hong Kong again soon. The other ones, I think I've specifically seen the interns, but no promises. I am the least appealing a part of the intern um, process. More importantly, you'll learn about all things like uh, quantitative trading and software engineering and quantitative research and business development, which I just read off a list. You've seen what I do for a living. It's this. Anyway, Jane Street, uh, they're incredible at what they do. And if you want to do an internship, I highly recommend going to janestreet.com slash join Jane Street with hyphens in it. And if you want, uh, slash internships or something. The link is on the screen. Do check it out. Uh, they're great. And maybe I'll see you at one of the offices. There you are. Thank you, Jane Street. 
I can see clearly now. 